What's up guys, we're back. We're here, it's Sunday school this morning. It's a little different, we're still in July. It's still July, it's not August yet. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying the summer as much as I am. Even though it's weird, even though it's different, I hope you have been enjoying, I hope you've been digging in, um, getting into the Word, spending some time with the Lord every day, and getting excited for when we get to get back together, which will hopefully be very soon. Kimberly and I are here for you. We're praying for you. Uh, if you need anything, do not hesitate. I mean it. Do not hesitate to reach out to us uh, or your small group leaders, and your leaders in our student ministry. Do not hesitate to reach out to us. We are here for you guys. Um, man, I love getting into the Word. I love what we're studying these past few months. We're studying Jesus himself. First, we studied Jesus who he is as healer, like he is healer. Now we're studying Jesus, who he is as teacher. And he's been focusing on, we've been focusing on how he's teaching us about discipleship. And last week we talked about how Jesus teaches us to pray. It's that spiritual habit that we like to forget. Or it's that spiritual habit that we're not disciplined enough to dig into. And remember last week we said three big things concerning prayer. One, we need to pray with urgent dependence. Two, we need to faithfully pray. And number three, as we pray, do not give up. Do not give up. This week, Jesus goes in on teaching about treasure. Teaching about treasure. And treasure is one of those things that every great story all these great stories have. Just think about um, early 2000s. And Disney put out The Curse of the Black Pearl, Pirates of the Caribbean, focusing on one of their original rides out in Disneyland in California. And what was the whole goal of the film? It was, it was the treasure. They're all searching for the treasure. But then searching for the treasure pushes us to ask the question when it comes to treasure itself, what we value, what we long for, what we desire. And who is that treasure really for? And ultimately in the film, Johnny Depp wanted to regain his humanity. Um, he wanted to regain his humanity. For us, the question is, is the treasure really for us or is it something more? Jesus teaches on treasure and it's a little bit different. If you have your Bibles, if you have your iPhone, iPad, pull up the Bible app, open up your Bibles, turn it to Luke chapter 12. We're going to look today in Luke chapter 12 and Jesus tells us three things. One, he says, be rich toward God. Number two, we need to take and we need to rest in God's provision. And number three, that we need to seek the kingdom instead of ourselves. Seek the kingdom instead of ourselves. So jump in, read with me beginning in verse 15 of Luke chapter 12. He then told them, this is Jesus speaking, watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. Then he told them a parable. A rich man's land was very productive. He thought to himself, what should I do? Since I don't have anywhere to store my crops, I will do this, he said. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life is demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? And then Jesus transitions out of the parable, just into talking to the disciples again, and to the crowd, and 
kind of just explaining it almost. And he says, that's how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So the big keys here for you and for me, this key point, be rich toward God. Be rich toward God. The keys to this passage are in the beginning and end of it. Verse 16. Man, one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. And then verse 21, it tells us, man, man, the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God is like the guy who's in the parable. That's who those people are. And here's the, here's the emphasis. The man in the parable, a lot of the world around you right now tells you this. Your salvation is in yourself and in what you can do for yourself. The world tells you your salvation is in how much money you have. Your salvation is in how much stuff you have that's really expensive. I'm not talking about you could be a person who has like 6,000 pencils. No, no, no. I'm talking about, man, you're the guy that has 12 pairs of Yeezys. You're getting one of the first PlayStation 5s out there. You got the cool truck. Your salvation is in your possessions is what the world tells you. When you get older, it's, man, what does your job pay you? How much are you throwing away into retirement? When are you going to become a millionaire? The world tells you your salvation is in your stuff. And how do you get your stuff? Yourself. And it tells you, no matter what, no matter what, be rich towards yourself. Don't be rich towards anyone else. Don't even think about being rich towards God. So in the 20s, in Egypt, that famed discovery of King Tutankhamun's, King Tut's tomb was found, right? It took the guy, the archaeologist, an Egyptologist, 10 years to catalog all of the stuff that was in King Tut's tomb. He had 5,398 pieces of artifacts. Like linen underwear was one of them. So, so fascinating. Linen underwear was one of the things in the tomb. Why? Because he wanted to take it with him into the afterlife. And if it wasn't entombed with you, it didn't go. It's not a new idea. It's not a new idea that our possessions save us and our possessions are what we should be striving for. Jesus says, don't be like that. He says, instead... He says, be rich toward God. So my question for you is this. What are your possessions for? What is your money for? Jesus isn't sitting here saying money's a bad thing. That's not what he's saying at all. Don't take that out of this at all. He's not saying money is bad. He's not. The question he has for us is, with what we have, are we being rich toward God or are we being selfish? One. And two, do we really think that the stuff that we have, the possessions that we have, they save us? That ultimately they're the most important thing. Striving for more and more and more money. Striving for the the cooler job or the nicer car or getting into the more prestigious college. Do those things save us? 
Because ultimately, if we think that, then we are not being rich toward God at all. We're being trying to be rich toward ourselves. Notice number two. Jesus tells us, man, when it comes to treasure this, he says rest, and the key word here is rest in God's provision. Keep reading with me, beginning in verse 22. Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life. What you will eat or about the body, what you will wear, for life is more than food and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, these birds. They don't sow or reap. They don't have a storeroom or a barn. Yet God feeds them. Aren't you much more valuable than the birds? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying. If then you're not able to do even a little thing, why worry about the rest? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes The grass which is in the field today and is thrown into the furnace tomorrow. How much more will he do for you, you of little faith? Rest in God's provision. Notice the imperative here. Notice the command that Jesus tells his disciples, that Jesus tells you, that Jesus tells me on a daily basis is this. Do not Worry. Do not worry. I'll say it one more time. Do not worry. And I'll tell you this. It's one of the hardest things to do. Especially right now. Especially right now. I don't know what's in your brain, but you might be thinking, well, last week we were told that we were going to get to go back to school at a normal time. This week we're told we're not even going to get to go back till September 8th. Are they going to pull the rug out from underneath us again next week and say, oh, we're not even going back to school until January? Now, hear me out. I do not know anything about that, so that's just hypothetical. But in your brains, you might be worrying about that. And notice what Scripture tells us. It says, do not worry. It doesn't mean do not work. It doesn't mean do... Jesus isn't telling his disciples to be lazy here. That's not what he's saying. But in the end, he's saying, rest in my provision. Rest in knowing that I'm good and I have you cared for. Rest in that. Man, Genesis 1 (laughs) tells us straight up, man, that work is good for us. Adam and Eve in the garden, from the very beginning, were working. Work is not some necessarily result of the fall. Is it harder because of the fall and man's sin? Yes. But work is not a bad thing. So Jesus isn't saying here, for instance, when it comes to you being in school and you're sitting in math class and your teacher says, oh, you've got a test tomorrow. Remember that. He's not telling you to sit there and say, ah, no worries. We got this covered. I'm not even going to study. He's not saying that. He's saying that right now in your position in life as a student, that's your job. That's your work. Do it with greatness. Do it for his glory. Greatly. But know this, that your identity doesn't rest in a grade. Know this, that your identity does not rest in which class you're in but rather rest in the fact that he has it all under control and that his provision for you is right. 
And so do not worry. Means do not worry and rest in Him and His provision. But also work. Do your work. And then Jesus gets in on this and He reminds the disciples. They remember the greatness of King Solomon. They remember who he is. They remember what he was doing. They remember the craziness of him having like 900 wives. They also remember the fact that, man, he was the wisest man ever to live. And that he built this monstrous palace. And that he was extremely wealthy. And Jesus looks at the disciples and tells them this. Hey, guys. Do you remember Solomon? And they're all sitting there like, yeah, that man had it all. And Jesus says, man, pay attention to the flowers of the field. Pay attention. Look at the wild flowers all around you. Solomon himself wasn't clothed like this. What Jesus is hitting home here is this. Those flowers were cared for by God himself. Through the hands of a farmer. Through the rain that the Lord provided. Fertile soil. All of it. Those wildflowers didn't worry about their lives. Instead, they rested in the provision of God. Now, obviously, wildflowers don't have consciences and don't have minds and can't actually think and things like that. But the point holds true for you, for me, for the world, that Jesus is sitting here telling us that we should rest in his provision, that his timing is perfect, and that his provision is perfect, that he's going to care for you through everything, through your best days and through your worst days. He is going to care for you. Man, I don't know what your favorite flower is. You can yell it out right now. Maybe it's a rose. Maybe you're some dude there sitting like, you know, I don't have a favorite flower. So I want to, I want to show you a picture. These are my favorite flowers. I don't know what it is about tulips, but tulips are just beautiful. Man, tulips are beautiful flowers. And the picture you're looking at is from the Netherlands. The Netherlands is one of the highest growers of tulips in the world, and so they have all of these beautiful tulip farms. And none of those tulips care for themselves. None of those tulips are worrying about, man, where are we going to get water for the next six days? They're being provided for. I encourage you. I'm reminded of this a lot. When you begin to worry, when you begin to get anxious, then just stop right there. Stop and do what Jesus taught us to do last week. To pray with him, to pray to him with urgent dependence. That we're in need of him and his provision. Number three, here's the big one. Seek the kingdom instead of ourselves. Verse 31, but seek his kingdom and these things will be provided for you. Don't be afraid, little flock, because your father delights to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Make money bags for yourselves that won't grow old. An inexhaustible treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. Verse 34, for where 
your treasure is there your heart will be also. So George Mueller was this guy who lived in England and, and showed what it looked like to live a praying life. <coughs> Excuse me. And as he was living this life, he ran an orphanage. And a famous story is he woke up, he went to the orphanage, and there's 300 kids there. And they don't have any food. Nothing. And the caretaker of the orphanage who's in charge, she comes to him and he tells her, man, just take him into the cafeteria. Take him into the cafeteria. And he just prays. He prays for the Lord's provision. He prays for the Lord to provide. He prays that the Lord would show his greatness and show his kingdom. And so a baker comes to him and says, Mr. Mueller, I, I couldn't sleep last night. I just truly believe that you needed bread, so I woke up early this morning and, and baked some bread. Here you go. Takes it in the cafeteria, gets another knock on the door. It's the milk guy. And, and the dude says, Mr. Mueller, man, my milk cart, We've got a wheel that's broken. Uh, can you use some milk? Because if I don't get rid of it right now, it's going to spoil. By the time that our wagon's fixed. And he says, yes, man, we can use it. Man, remember in that last point that we were told that we need to rest in God's provision. And this story of George Mueller and his care and his praying life. And we see it all collide as he's seeking the kingdom of God to be advanced. He's seeking the kingdom of God to be advanced, to go forward as he's caring for the orphans, as he's teaching them about who Jesus is, what Jesus has done. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that at every single moment as you pray and you seek Him and you seek the kingdom, that all your desires and everything's going to be brought to you like this. That's not what I'm saying. Man, God works in His way in His time. But my question for you with this final point, with this, this whole thing, is this. Are the greatest desires of your heart? Are your greatest goals and achievements and everything? Are they kingdom oriented? Or are they selfish? And in the end, Jesus leads the disciples with the statement, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Remember, the Pirates of the Caribbean, Johnny Depp wanted to take and get back to that treasure so that he didn't have to be a cursed skeleton forever. But he also kind of wanted to be one. And in his mind, it just played out over and over and over again. Like he just couldn't figure it out. Like, which is, like, which is going to be better? Like, what's better for me? Like, I know what this does to people if you have this treasure and take this treasure, but I really want all this gold, too. Right? In the end, for him, it was self-seeking the whole way. Treasure for him was self-seeking. For you and me, where is your treasure? What do you desire more than anything else? Are you seeking the kingdom of God on a daily basis? Are you spending time with him? What are you doing? 
Man, I love you guys. I'm here for you guys. I'm praying for you guys. I'm excited to be back with you soon. Know that we will be back soon. We love you. We'll see you later. Peace.